Okay, well, we're at 26 people, so perhaps I'll get started. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome um, to this special evening. It's the Interdependence Panel Talk, which is part of Onca's online offer for the Remembrance Day for Lost Species 10th anniversary with its theme of interdependence. Thank you very, very much for coming. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I'm Persephone Pearl. I'm a co-director at Onca, which is an arts organisation in Brighton, England. Um, Onca supports artists and audiences to explore environmental and social justice issues. I'm also one of the co-founders of Lost Species Day or Remembrance Day for Lost Species, which falls on November the 30th. And it's a recurring chance each year to explore the stories of extinct and critically endangered species, cultures, and ecological communities. I and the panelists are gonna give uh, short visual descriptions of ourselves for accessibility. So I am just gonna look at myself. I'm reading a script at the moment. Um, I'm a white woman in my forties. I've got bleached hair and I'm wearing a gray sweatshirt. I'm sitting in front of a green curtain and I've got a spider plant in the background. Um, there's a little dog that's making rather there's a lot of chewing noises nearby, so sorry, I'll be turning off my um, microphone soon. Uh, there are a number of events happening for Lost Species Day, uh, public and private. Some of you, uh, I hope, may have been at the Parallel Effects Vigil for the Smooth Handfish yesterday and the uh, brilliant panel discussion on grief, ritual and creativity that followed that. And I just wanted to flag that tomorrow evening at 6.30, this time tomorrow, we're hosting a ritual for Lost Species with a trans personal ritual practitioner, B. Hugh. And that will be preceded by um, a discussion that's been organized by our friends at art.earth. Um, it's gonna be an online conversation with a uh, psychotherapist and Climate Psychology Alliance executive, Caroline Hickman at five. So those two events will run together. This webinar is being recorded. It will be up to 90 minutes long and I'll shortly be handing over to our chair, Jennifer Uchendu to introduce our brilliant panelists to whom we're deeply grateful for the time that they're giving. After the short presentations on tonight's themes of intergenerational and transnational climate justice, eco-emotions and the role of art in well-being, there will be a comfort break. And then there'll be a conversation between the four panelists based on any questions that you type into the Q&A box, we'll sort through them. So get comfortable as we dive into our evening with, <clears throat> with the panel. Jennifer, our chair is an eco-feminist and sustainable development advocate based in Lagos, Nigeria. She's the founder of Susty Vibes, a youth-led organization making sustainability actionable and relatable to young people. Jennifer's interests lie at the intersections of youth, women and climate action. She researches and advocates on issues around climate justice, art, youth and eco-anxiety. Welcome Jennifer and over to you. Thank you so much, Persephone. That was brilliant. Always good to hear my bio being read out. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone from wherever you're joining in. My name is Jennifer Uchindu, and um, Percy has kindly introduced me. Today, we're going to be doing something really special, but um, to give a visual description of myself, I'm a black woman in her late 20s. I currently have cornrows. I'm wearing an African print top and my background is blurred, so it's um, not very visible. Today we want to talk about a topic that is really, really dear to all of the panelists, which have been specially curated and invited to this space to you know, talk about something really important. And that's the idea of interdependence, the idea of man and nature, the idea of our emotions and how they play out in our understanding 
an adaptation in within the climate crisis in the face of biodiversity loss, the climate crisis, and even on the backdrop of COP26, which I, I had the privilege, or as it were, to attend a couple of weeks ago. And um, like many people, COP26 left me in my feelings, in my feelings about the climate crisis, in my feelings about my place as a youth climate activist, as it were, and what that really means moving forward in terms of intersectionality and whatnot. And we'll touch on all of that today, but um, two things I would like to just give us as an introduction. The very first is to let you all know that this is a safe space. All of our panelists are deeply grounded in this idea of equal emotion. So if it gets too much at any point, you know, feel free to take a moment and pause, but also understand that you're allowed to be vulnerable. You're allowed to put out your feelings. We all acknowledge and agree that eco anxiety and eco emotions are valid and very healthy responses to the climate crisis. The very second thing I want us to do, if possible, is to have a check in. Um, if we can use the chat, I would, I'd like to know how we're feeling today, um, particularly in relation to the topic, particularly in relation to all that we see around us, everything in the news, everything following COP26. In one word, how, how are you feeling? Um, for me, I've moved from numb to just fired up, really. We need to get the work done. This is a marathon. So it's been that spectrum of feeling. So really, really looking forward to read um, from our participants. Just in one word, you can let us know how you're feeling um, right now. Thank you. Well, Tricia says she's paralyzed. That's valid, that's understandable. Suvan is connected, really important. One of the backdrops of COP26 was seeing connectedness coming from, um, from community organizations and CSOs. So this is definitely valid. Um, someone says he's resigned. That's interesting to see and also valid because it's, it's really a spectrum of emotions. Helen feels fragile. Indeed, we are fragile. And um, part of our conversation with Eloise would even touch on that and why it's important to acknowledge our fragility in the face of biodiversity loss and the climate crisis as it were. Um, Maddie is conflicted. Indeed, it's, it's, it's valid to be conflicted. And um, I know Sarah will touch on that um, um, also. Gabriel feels lost. Um, Gabriel, we, we hope that at the end of the day, at the end of today, you could find some redirection as it were. That's totally valid to feel lost. Interestingly, in 2019, following COP, I just wanted to stop being a climate activist and, you know, just do something else with my life. I thought of acting, <laughs> if that would, you know, work out for me in Nigeria. But yes, these are valid emotions. And thank you all so much for sharing and for bringing up these experiences. They are valid and they are useful. Um, so I'll go on to introduce my really, really brilliant panelists. I want you to feel free to, in the course of this session, write in your questions, any comment coming to your mind. At some point, we'll have a Q&A, an open discussion, where we'll be able to talk through with the panelists and um, help with your questions. So please post your questions, and that would be um, curated at um, the Q&A session. Now to my panelists, really, really brilliant. So I'll take them. Um, one after the other as I um, ask the questions. Um, so our very first um, panelist is Sarah, Sarah Jacket Ray, um, who I used her book um, last year for my thesis on eco-anxiety. So it's such a privilege to have her as a co-panelist here today. Sarah is a professor and a chair of environmental studies at the Humboldt State University on Wewood Territory in Akaka, California. And her work focuses on environmental humanities, climate justice pedagogy, and climate psychology. She's the author of two books, The Ecological Order, Environmental Exclusion in American Culture, and most recently, a favorite for me, a field guide to climate anxiety, how to keep your cool 
on a warming planet. Sarah publishes and speaks extensively on topics of eco of emotions, climate justice, and youth activism. And she's currently working on a project to help educators inculcate ex existential skills that students will need to survive and thrive in a climate change world. Um, the project is called an existential toolkit for climate justice educators. Really looking forward to that. And thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Um, before you introduce yourself, I'll just pose my initial question to you. Given that you are so sort of um, involved in young people as an educator, and you've experienced, you know, these different ranges of eco anxiety, I'm sure you've related to some of the emotions that have even come up today. I'd like to know what have you noticed about youth climate anxiety, and really how did that inspire you to write, you know, the book that has been really helpful to many of us. Um, and what are you trying to achieve with the book? So it's two questions in one, um, what you've noticed and really your objective in, in the short and the long run. Thank you and over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Jennifer. <clears throat> Thank you so much Persephone and Anka and everybody who's here. I'm just very uh, extremely honored and uh, will go anywhere Jennifer asked me to, uh, really one of my idols. Uh, inspired and honored that you read my book, my goodness. <laughs> um, so um, my appearance, just really quickly, I am um, sitting in my chair in my office uh, at Humboldt State University. I have a big plant behind me and the banner for environmental studies, the department I chair. I'm a white woman with sort of medium length blonde hair and big old glasses. And I even threw on some lipstick for you today. And I wanted to also um, take the opportunity to do um, a little bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, Beverly and I are sharing this um, today. Um, I'm coming, I'm speaking from you from Humboldt State University, which is on Weat territory. We, the Weat peoples include the Weat tribe, Bear, Ran Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. And in Weat, Arcata actually uh, means Gudini, is Gudini, which means over in the redwoods. And we are um, in a landscape here where the historical and current efforts for land stewardship are very present in our, our every uh, in our in our work all the time, in very far northern California, almost at the Oregon border, very near the Klamath River. If you're familiar with Klamath um, Klamath River indigenous um, uh, land practices. But the acknowledgement, as I'm reminded by my fabulous um, colleague, Kutcher Rizling Baldy, the land acknowledgement can often just be an excuse to not do anything. And so it must come with um, action, as she reminds me to do. And so I think frequently in an land acknowledgement, verbalizing what I'm committed to doing as a, as a result of that land acknowledgement. And so one of the things, and I'll put these things in the chat, um, one of the things, the, the, the easiest and first thing to do, of course, is to find out what land you're on. And so I've included a, um, a link to, to, for that, if you don't already know that. And also in um, my neck of the woods, there's an honor tax to the Weot tribe that people can pay. So if you are interested in doing that, you're welcome to do that. That is available through the second link I sent, which is Cut Your Rizzling Spaldi, um, lecture on what good is a land acknowledgement, which I highly recommend and it's been very inspiring to me. It also commits me to um, learning that there's no such thing as wilderness and that the myths about nature, especially that have dominated in the US context since colonization and the 19th century are really damaging and they've been used to justify the dispossession of indigenous peoples from the lands. And that those myths about nature, which are still taught so, so frequently, continue to erase indigenous peoples from, environment, from the environment and from environmental decision-making. So I think about often what does it mean to decolonize the environmental and, envir and climate movements as my commitment. Um, so in response to Jennifer's wonderful question and um, thinking about how my book landed in her into her consciousness and what, what my intention there was. And I, I really do wanna weave in ideas about interconnection and interdependence too, because there's, there's so much there to, to talk about as well. Um, I actually, I was writing this in, in my description of my intro to this group here, trying to ponder on how I even came to think about climate anxiety as a topic requires I even figure out how, I, how I've 
oriented myself to climate change in general. And in my early days of thinking about environmental justice, um, I came to thinking about environmental issues as a lens to understand justice questions. And climate change at that time was really seen by the justice community, people are thinking about justice as a, almost a distraction from justice. It was something that privileged people who could, who could take the time or the capacity and the scientific wherewithal to understand things like polar ice caps and melting you know, glaciers and currents in the ocean and that sort of thing. That that was really that level of interest was really only for people who you know in sort of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs who were at the sort of higher echelons, and so in many ways I spent the early days of my graduate career criticizing the attention around climate change and asking for a more justice oriented approach to thinking about environmental problems and really not putting the two things together. It really wasn't until around 2015 or so when it became very clear at the COPS and various other actions around the US, the People's Climate March and whatnot, where indigenous movements um, through, especially thinking about Idle No More and Standing Rock, um, movements for immigrants' rights, youth movements, women's movements, all kinds of environmental justice movements were coming together under the banner of climate and drawing the connections and making the dots. And that was when I first thought, okay, now this is something to pay attention to. Now I'm, now I'm interested in how we can use climate to advocate for these other movements. But of course, once I got into climate, I started to see all the ways that climate, the climate movement was in fact really insensitive to, if not um, getting in the way of justice questions. So there's still a lot of work to be done there, but it's. But I'd say in 2021, we're at a moment where the interconnection and inter interdependence of, of human life and, and non-human life with ecosystems is becoming more and more, we're becoming more aware of that and it's sort of normal to think about social justice questions and ecological questions as interconnected. And, and the way that I came to realizing that was through these movements, but also through my students. They come into my classrooms already aware of that now in the past five or six years, students already know that. I don't have to teach that anymore. Now I have to figure out what, what else to teach because they know that already. So this is a real different moment in, in how young people are approaching the connection between climate and social justice. And so what, how did emotions come into that? Emotions came into that about five or six years ago when I myself was in a sort of weird denial about climate, coming around to caring about climate, having to really reckon with the fact that this was, this was bad and, and really not wanting to, having my own sense of dissonance and denial, all those Ds that you know, Perez and Stokes talk about, talks about in his wonderful book, um, this sort of denial that um, Carrie Norgard writes about in Living in Denial. I really had that cognitive dissonance and problem and I hadn't really quite coped with climate change, but my students were doing that. My students were coming into class just totally despaired, totally, you know, just through the floor. And I thought to myself, our, our materials for our university and, and what do we say we are gonna teach students says that they're gonna go out and be these wonderful change agents in the world and do all this wonderful stuff for the planet. And yet they can't even get to class. I mean, they're, they're on the brink of, you know, no, not living, you know. Um, so the sense of their men, the mental health profile, started to research the mental health profile of incoming students, it, it turned out there was quite a different profile. I started to realize this generation is actually quite different. There's many things that are different. They're the largest generation. They're the most ethnically diverse generation. They're the, gonna be less, the first generation that's gonna be less well off and have a long, shorter life than their parents. There's all kinds of things that I thought, no wonder there's a mental health problem with this generation. And, and since I study environmental problems and I was seeing it in my classrooms, I wanted to add to the equation, climate change and environmental problems. And so what I found was missing at the time was a conversation around the mental health discussion around young people and climate change. I kept thinking, wake up everybody, climate change is part of this problem. You know, we, These young people are telling me that climate change is a major source of their despair. So I started to say I needed to turn my research towards figuring out what were the tools, what was the new stuff that they needed to get out of this, how are we going to get them to wake up in the morning to come to class and, and take the time it's going to take to become agents of change and to walk across the graduation stage and actually go out into the world and, and do something and, and do it for their lives, the marathon of the work, the long haul of the work, not burn out, not you know die under the urgency of this and the despair of it. And, and, and that's really what, what motivated me to write the book. What were the tools that, that young people were gonna need? 
and and you know what were what were the fields of and disciplines that we could bring together who are all thinking about this stuff and that's where uh, kind of humanities approach to this you know I'll take anything that works give me anything whether it's from science from communication from feminist studies from ethnic studies from whatever discipline and try to put it together in in a way that's digestible and readable for young people what I would hope what I hope would come out of that book quite frankly was that you know, I, I didn't see myself as a, a frontline activist like Jennifer here or like El Eloise. You know, I really saw myself as the person in the classroom trying to equip those people in every sector that they go into, whether it is activism or in their careers or in their whatever, whatever sphere of their life they can plug it in, how to make sure they're emboldened and have the stamina and have the the, the, the joyful militancy as it's described in one book or, or, or what Adrian Marie Brown calls pleasure activism, you know, that they can keep coming to the table and keep engaging. And, and some people might call that resilience. It's, it has a different, different kind of connotations depending on your context. And to do so in a way that's about solidarity with justice movements because big climate or big environmental emotions, big emotions in general can lead us either to you know, fear and adding more harm to others and the planet, or it can lead us to solidarity and collective action. And so just having really big emotions can be quite scary. It can go one, or one of both directions. And I really wanted to help shepherd students towards thinking about not becoming isolationist, not becoming xenophobic, not becoming fearful of others, right? When we see this, we see eco-fascism merging out of climate anxiety too. We see a lot of um, harm done out in the name of climate anxiety. Um, you know, the, if we think about the, the um, letters that have been written by the people who did the mass, the person who did the mass shooting in El Paso and in Christchurch, they explicitly pointed to climate change and the desire to wipe certain people off the planet because of climate change. And this is why what justify their motivation. And this is a long, actually a long, it's not, it's not actually out of the ordinary. That sentiment, that kind of eco-fascist or green hate sentiment has a long history in, in especially US, US environmentalism, but in other places as well. And so while we have this huge wave of climate anxiety happening among youth that I was trying to wrap my, my, my head around, and how, if, if, if the job of an educator is no longer just to get them to care more, they care, now what, right? They're caring so much they're falling off the edge of the cliff, right? How do we get them to actually be emboldened in the interior resources that they would need to do this work for their lives and for the long haul in a way that's in alignment with justice and not against it? And so that was my main purpose. Could I, could I support this generation and help them see their interconnectedness with each other, help them see they're interconnected with the, with the planet? For me, somebody just asked me this morning, I just gave a book talk to a high school, which is, you know, high schoolers. Oh my goodness, you know, I'm used to college students. So high school is a whole different matter entirely. But one of the students asked, do I experience climate anxiety? What do I do about, how do I feel, how do I deal with that? And the answer kept coming back, back down to, if we continue with this myth of individualism and that we we are individually incapable of making a difference, this drop in the bucket imaginary, and that we, you know, that will that will turn us off to, off to participating. We won't participate. We'll feel deflated. We feel like we have nothing. But the minute we tap into the collective, the minute we see the the organizing happening, what Paul Hawken calls the blessed unrest, or what Joanna Macy calls the great turning, the minute we're participating in that great turning, it is actually a joyful experience. It feels like sense of purpose fulfillment. All of the things that need to be ticked off for us for eudaimonia, this feeling of having a sense of purpose, and antidote to global dread, what Glenn Albrecht calls global dread. And this sort of participation in the collective is the number one thing I think that we can do. Similarly, when I think about actions I can personally take to reduce my impact on the planet as a first world person who is making the worst impacts on the planet, my actions could make the most impact more than most people. So what are the ways I can reduce harm and what is the motivation I need to tap into? Well, this instrumentalism, this idea that if, you know, if I'm only willing to do it and make those sacrifices, if it'll make a difference. 
That is a myth that we need to combat. In fact, the motivation for us to do this work needs to be rooted in because it motivates us for the long haul. It's an it's attractive, positive, reinforcing quality is a sense of what Robin Wall Kimmerer calls practical reverence or interconnectedness. Um, I love Kyle Powis White's beautiful recent interview in Gris, Ma Gris Magazine. I recommend you look it up where he talks about the climate crisis isn't just about what's in the atmosphere. It's a crisis of ruined kinship relations. And so if I think about my personal actions as connected to, is reconnecting me to inner relation, it, it gets me going for the long haul. And Jennifer, you're telling me to stop talking. And so that's what I hope to achieve with the book. And that was, I'll draw the line under it. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, so much to unpack. I'm taking notes and scribbling really quickly because that's absolutely brilliant. And um, please feel free to drop comments and questions um, from everything Sarah has said. Um, we'll take time out after um, a break later on to, to look at those and to respond to those. Thank you so much, Sarah. So um, a, a bit of background um, just before I go to Beverly to say um, I did my master's thesis looking at eco-anxiety really putting myself as a young black woman from Nigeria with youth climate activists that were based in the UK and then also looking at the spaces where they relate and one of those spaces was schools and even recognizing that the teachers themselves were also going through a form of eco-anxiety just as you've mentioned and that denial of you know let's just teach them what they need to know the climate is changing and not just pausing to say, okay, what's happening to me? How do I feel about everything that I'm teaching and particularly how the students are responding to all that's being taught. And one of the, one of the ways you can do that, one of the spaces that can be really helpful is art. I know you mentioned you know, the feminist movements and all of that, but also art can be useful, art can be helpful. We say that eco-anxiety is healthy, it's okay, it's normal you know, to feel all of these things. But just as you mentioned, um, you said the big emotions are scary, they're overwhelming, you know, lots of young people are having to break down and cry, you know, Carolyn Hickman calls it a moral injury, I think it's a burden of hope, you know, placed on young people, and there comes in art in a way, and, and for me, Anka did that for me while I was in Brighton, just having a safe space to go and be vulnerable and say, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. Oh my God, I need to feel better. I need to feel inspired and fired up. And I'm going to um, speak with Beverly now to, to talk about her work with art and, and the process it does with he healing. Now, Beverly Nidus is a US-based interdisciplinary artist, writer, and facilitator. She has been creating interactive installations, digital projects, artist book and narrative and conceptual draw drawings for over four decades, inspired by lived experience. Very important to note that topics in her art focus on environmental and social issues, including how we are individually and collectively affected by racism, climate change and multiple forms of systemic oppression. And I know Sarah has touched a bit on that. Um, Beverly, I'll let you introduce yourself with the um, visual description and also your land acknowledgements before I go on to ask you a question and we look at your presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's a real honor to be here sitting with such powerful women. Um, who have done so much work that inspires me and hopefully will inspire the collective. I am sitting um, here in my office. I am an olive complected woman in her late 60s with graying um, dark hair, uh, pink uh, transparent glasses, earrings, and a gray striped scarf. Um, my office has morning light coming in. It's actually a sunny day here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I'd like to offer this land acknowledgement. Um, we who live on colonized and stolen land, whose indigenous roots come from elsewhere, acknowledge that our presence here requires being accountable in word and deed 
to the many centuries of extraction, exploitation, and genocide in this region and elsewhere on Turtle Island. We want to honor the ancestral presence of the Coast Salish tribes, especially the Puyallup people who have lived and cared for these waters and lands in Tacoma, Washington for thousands of years. And we will continue taking actions to undo the harm done by the continued violation of the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854. I come this morning with the spirits of my landless ancestors who found comfort connecting to the plants, animals, and minerals wherever they were allowed to live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank you. Um, so my question is really simple and direct. Your bio and the work that you've done, you know, speaks for itself. So I'll let you um, share a presentation that gives us insight to how lived experiences have, you know, informed your own work with art and how that interplays with eco emotions. Over to you, Beverly. Thank you so much. I'm going to set up my slide presentation here. It'll take one second. And um, I have to stop share and then share again. It's a very funny system here. So here we go. Um, I want to acknowledge that I have been working with emotions around ecocide since I was in my 20s, um, very early 20s. And I was having lots of nightmares about nuclear war my generation was very traumatized by air raid drills for nuclear war. And um, it was, you know, not that long after that, that I became aware of um, environmental degradation and ecocide and started making artwork about that as well. I was fortunate to work with both Joanna Macy and Thich Nhat Hanh back in the 80s and both of their um, spiritual practices and a deeper understanding of how our despair and grief connects us to each other um, was really, really helpful to me. And I also discovered that um, when I was working as an artist in residence at the Institute for Social Ecology in Vermont, that sitting in my despair was not particularly useful for transforming the situation that we're living in. Um, my latest uh, body of work was, has been done during the pandemic and I wanted to share some of that with you today. Um, this is a series of pandemic healing deities. I started doing healing deities when I was sick and disabled by an environmental illness. And I was working on a project called Canary Notes, which I'm not gonna share here, but you can find on my website. I was meeting lots of people who were sick in clinics from pesticides and from modernity, the ills of civilization. Um, and these people were hidden but they referred to themselves and we referred to ourselves as canaries, canaries in the coal mine. My son was watching me paint these paintings on my computer because I was allergic to all my art supplies at that point. And he said, mom, why are you always painting sick people? And I thought, oh, I've been only focusing on what's wrong. It's time for me to focus on what the healing might be. So here on the left, you can see Akilanda, the goddess of never not broken. And she's a goddess for this time because almost all of us are breaking every day with the news, with our communities, we are breaking, but we need to keep moving. And the goddess in Hindu mythology rides on a crocodile and creates an interdependent relationship with the natural world. Now, um, in nine, 2018, I was still convinced that my work as an artist was 
to invite more people into their activism, to break through their cynicism and despair and their overwhelm and to wipe their feet on it, literally. So I created doormats for this installation that said things like, we should just go extinct or already toxic or no time and we'll never agree, revolution is too scary. And they had to walk through trauma curtains, um, all the different traumas of the day, including species going extinct every day. The title of this exhibition, which was on display in Brighton, was We Almost Didn't Make It. And the rest of the phrase is, we almost didn't make it, but you did not give up and we are alive in your future. What choices you make and what actions you take may make it possible for us to not only exist, but thrive. So I asked and invited visitors to the gallery to step into their, their sense of themselves as ancestors to figure out what um, they wanted to do as activists and to create an object which they put in the center of this portal I called the portal of possibilities. And the object represented something that they thought might not exist in 150 years. And into that object, they were invited to insert a commitment to an action that might help future generations thrive. Uh, walking through the trauma curtains was traumatic. And when they came back to my studio here in Tacoma, during the pandemic, I said, it's time to heal these traumas. So in the past year, I created the Dead Ocean Scrolls and Other Possible Futures and pandemic deities, healing deities that could sit inside these scrolls. And I imagined a future society, one that's not that far away from ours, um, that sat with their feelings of grief and opened up to them, connected to each other through them, breathing through them, and seeing ourselves as the soil, as the water, as the air. And this is the mycelium bodhisattva who helped in this process. Um, this is because social ecology is about looking at social justice and ecological issues connected to each other that we cannot solve ecocide unless we deal with racism, unless we deal with homophobia and all the other systemic oppressions. So <clears throat> here <clears throat> is a trauma curtain that looks at the fact that slave slavery is still happening. And <clears throat> I tried to heal it by putting in, um, this is uh, a liberation deity and um, I named that the brutal legacy of exploitation was deep and it could not be ignored and that healing will continue for generations. Um, this was the trauma curtain about the West Coast being on fire and hurricanes coming right after another. And I placed within in it the weather calming goddess um, and these are now on display at the Tacoma Community College Gallery and students are coming in and interacting with them, asking questions. Um, this is the trauma curtain for drowning in plastic and radioactive oceans. And the navigator Bodhisattva is trying to heal this space. Um, another project I've been involved in for a while is called the Story Hive Project. This is an interactive project helping people write down their stories about how they're navigating ecocide. And in this particular version, this is in the gallery, and I've invited people to answer these questions. How have you navigated the pandemic? What skills of resilience have you developed? What challenges have you faced and what support might you need? And what is your dream for the world we can co-create now? So <clears throat> it, this project is gathering lots of stories from visitors to the gallery as people are looking at the various pandemic healing deities. There are 30 of them on the wall. But <clears throat> it's not enough for me to stay inside the gallery. 
is really important now that I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, retired from teaching full time at the university, I'm doing work in the community because communities are struggling, all kinds of communities with every possible emotion that um, has been precipitated by the climate emergency as well as the violence um, that people are experiencing and all the isolation. So we created with our neighbors, the Tacoma Story Hive project. And here you can see the questions we've asked our neighbors in these uncertain times. What is your story? What are your dreams for the world we can co-create? How are you navigating this time? And we built this out of Cobb and um, it is about to be celebrated this weekend. We're going to bless the project for the community. And finally, I would like to read the epilogue for my exhibition um, and also show one image from a project <clears throat> that I did with local activists because artists can't just work alone anymore. We have to work with community, excuse me. <clears throat> We have to do self-care. That was my self-care for this morning. <clears throat> we need to work with um, our, our own emotions, but the emotions of activists and the emotions of all the different people in our communities if we want to make it through this time. So hold on one second while I... That was a much better throat clearing. Okay, here's the epilogue for the show. At this time when all seems lost, we need to take heart from those who have been most marginalized and oppressed. Our neighbors of African and indigenous descent have long histories of resistance in the most hostile and brutal of environments. Yet they persisted as have women, as have queer folks, and so many other peoples discarded and abused who pushed through their internalized oppression. We need to believe in a future despite the endless evidence that tells us otherwise and do our best to imagine what might heal these wounds, many of which seem impossible to heal. What would it look like if everyone could sit with the discomfort of doing this work? What would it feel like if we recognized our interconnections with each other, the ecosystem and the cosmos? What needs to melt inside us to see these deep truths? What about our despair makes us blind? It still seems possible to arrive in such a place through fearless joy and gratitude that moves our grief. Will you join us? The future is as yet unknown. In honor of all of our ancestors, we need to do this work. Thank you so much and our future descendants. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. That, that was so moving, every single bit of it. Thank <laughs> you so much. The future is yet unknown and, and art really gives us an opportunity to imagine what that future could be, right? Just as you've, you've mentioned. And I think that that offers hope, you know, in the face of eco emotions, but really something you've mentioned, there's, there's a work, um, the work that needs to be done. That's the work of reconnection and the work of really coming face to face with these emotions as a way to heal. Really, really brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. And really, I invite everyone to drop comments and questions. We're going to dig through them in the Q&A sessions. I have a lot of you know, notes I've penned down and I would let Eloise come up now and we can go later. I'm really excited to hear from Eloise, um, not just because she's um, 
a young person like me, but also because she's a colleague, um, a sister and compatriot, and really both of us in different ends of the world, um, feeling equal anxiety as it were, and wanting to play our beats in you know slightly different ways, but also valid and important ways. So I'll read through um, Eloise's um, bio. She's a master's student at the University of East Anglia, where she researches population ecology and rewilding alongside studying in the impacts of equal anxiety on young people around the world. Eloise is also a, men, a member of the UK Youth Climate Coalition, which is a youth activist group focusing on bringing climate justice to the forefront of the climate movement. Um, Eloise, you know, intersectionality coming up, you being, you know, um, involved in so, so many different things, particularly ecology. And um, today we want to also speak about Lost Species Day, biodiversity loss, and what that really means for us as um, interconnected parts of nature, and also, you know, a big part of nature, you know, looking at ourselves as a big part of nature. Um, just before, um, just as you introduce yourself with the visual representation, my very my question is very simple. Um, I, I would like you to give your own experience of equal anxiety. You know how you would describe it, but also interestingly, um, let's let's be relative in the sense that you being an eco ecologist studying that, what is that link, or how have you been able to weave through the threads of being an ecologist and also um, someone who has to manage and research equal anxiety in you know the present day world with the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and it's always wonderful working with you Jennifer <laughs> um, and you're hosting wonderfully. Um, so quickly the visual description. Um, I am a white looking esque <laughs> uh, young woman early 20s with very curly hair um, inside a bedroom which is mostly white and I'm wearing a black jumper. Um, I am based in Canterbury in the southeast of the UK for um, our international audience. Um, and yes, so as you said, I study ecology, I do a master in ecology, and this is the population ecology is the study of uh, the dynamics inside a population of a species. It's not really to do with people, it's any kind of organism that pushes and pulls. And for those who maybe are less sure of what ecology is, ecology in general is the study of connections between organisms and their environment. And then you have like social ecology, which is bringing people more in and understanding those like interconnections and those relationships is also very, very interesting. Um, and I am also, yeah, a young person growing up today. So at the moment I'm 24, I've probably been doing climate activism work or recognizing myself as a climate activist for about three years now. And I initially came into maybe climate activism in a more collective sense from my own eco-anxiety. I was very good early on at recognizing all the individual action things and being very focused on what can I do? I want to minimize my impact. And I started becoming very, very hyper-focused on my own individual impact um, to a degree which I realized with hindsight was becoming quite unhealthy. Um, a lot of the feelings that you asked the audience to share earlier, I was feeling um, eco-anxiety can come. It's not just one feeling, it's often a collection of different emotions, sometimes conflicting emotions, and it's a very sort of tumultuous, almost cyclical, I'd say, um, set of feelings. And for me, at my lowest, it was an overwhelming sense of guilt for the country I'm in, the UK, contributing so much to the climate crisis, my own impact from being here and existing here, maybe shame and still wanting to enjoy stuff I am young I've just begun begun my adult life I want to see things I want to do things I still like pretty dresses and all these sort of like conflicting feelings of shame overwhelm paralysis and I think um, in terms of climate justice we often talk very much about it on more of a spatial setting so countries which haven't contributed at all really to the climate crisis are often the ones feeling the most impact but there's also a temporal relationship there as well where the generations being born now have also contributed less to the impact of the climate crisis but are also going to feel the most of its impact so there's also a sense of um maybe betrayal and abandonment that um, in research i later did in eco-anxiety tends to be more common in the younger generations the sense that we're inheriting a dying planet um, and those who should be looking after us have failed to do so and now we're being burdened with the task to look after ourselves um, and that kind of yeah, I suppose betrayal and abandonment, that's often seen more in young people than necessarily old people, though, of course, any age group can feel eco-anxiety. 
And when I first started feeling these feelings of maybe fear or overwhelm, I was very frustrated at them. I didn't want to be feeling them. I thought that I needed to be the most productive eco warrior there was. I wanted to work hard. I wanted to save the world. I wanted to do things, but I kept falling over my own feelings. I was scared and I was overwhelmed and I was struggling. And I think other people said like feeling scattered um, and occasionally wanting to really disengage, feeling guilty for doing so. And as you can see, it's, it's a very tumultuous set of feelings. There's a lot of ricocheting around. And up during my work in climate activism, I encountered Caroline Hickman, who I really do encourage everyone to go see a talk tomorrow, for she is amazing, um, has been researching eco-anxiety for the past 10 years, particularly in children and young people. And she introduced me to the concept of eco-anxiety by, I didn't have a name for these feelings, I was feeling, I felt very alone with them. Um, and she told me that it was okay <laughs> to be feeling these feelings, it was very normal. She's seen it a hundred times over with so many other young people she's interacted with. And I was like, no, no, I don't want, to, I don't have time to feel these feelings. This is inconvenient. I want to, I, the, we don't have time. I need to save the world. And she's like, no, no, no. It's important for you to feel these feelings. They're a part of you and to deny them is also what's causing this sort of chaotic ricocheting in which you're feeling. And it took me a while to really understand what she was getting at for a while, because I suppose maybe coming up from a background, which again is very like high grades, be productive, work hard, succeed all the time sort of thing, which I think maybe a lot of people my generation get um, from school and kind of the expectations of going to work and things like that in university. I was like, I don't, I didn't understand why it would be good for me to feel bad, basically. I mean, put in the simplest ways. Um, and then with a bit more sort of reflection on these matters and my experience in the climate activism world also expanding, I made a connection which for me was very pivotal in me understanding um, climate anxiety, eco anxiety, and also allowed me to conduct research in it later as well. Um, and I related it back to my understanding of biodiversity and ecology. So as I said before, ecology is the connection between organisms and their environment. And you often see in the media a lot about the biodiversity. That's really important that we mustn't lose it, we must conserve it. But I think a lot of people see stuff about biodiversity loss, but don't really understand why it is so important to have biodiversity. Not just like the rhinos or the species, the individuals, but why biodiversity is often the word used most frequently. And so a quick, quick little ecology lesson is the reason why biodiversity is so important is because the more complex an ecosystem is, the more stable it is. So we have something called the diversity stability complex in ecology, which is basically, if you imagine an ecosystem, as a web and every little organism and all the variation are little links in the webs and little overlapping webs of connections and interactions and influence. You, if you have a biodiversity high rich ecosystem, those webs are really, really strong and really, really complicated and really, really intact. And the more links and connections that web has, the more resistant it is to any disturbance or perturbations that ecosystem has, and the more resilient it is, which is the easier it is for that ecosystem to build itself. So a biodiversity rich ecosystem will be less affected by things such as climate change. Um, but also let's say if a wildfire goes through it and does burn everything up, it's much quicker at recovering. Um, and then I thought, okay, so I understand this very sort of quite, um, grounding principle inside of ecology. And I realized that, wait, I think, I think feelings sort of work in a similar way. If you imagine your mind as an ecosystem, the more feelings that you have in it, the more tensions and equilibriums and connections you have for all your feelings, and that you allow them all to be and inhabit that space of your mind, the more resilient and resistant you are to the inevitable negative things that occur. A very biodiversity poor ecosystem is very weak. There's lots of holes, things break through, it can't rebuild. And it's also, if you imagine your mind, let's say either, what I was trying to do is create like a highly curated garden or a monoculture, which only had positive feelings, but only the happy and the love and the joy and the excitement. It's very, very like energy hard to maintain that garden with no weeds in it at all, or a monoculture where you're just spraying pesticides in time to keep everything else away. And it's also very fragile. It's very easy to break down when negative things will inevitably occur in our lives. And especially in a space such as the climate crisis, which often has a lot of negative news, you're much more fragile. You're not as resilient or resistant to, those new, to that news, to the information, to those negative things that might uh, come about in your experiences. But 
if I instead welcomed things such as the weeds and the brambles and the spiders and all these bits, which maybe I don't like so much by themselves, but all hold a very important space inside my mind ecosystem because they create that emotional biodiversity that we need, the interactions keep me strong. If I am able to be familiar and comfortable with the brambles and the weeds and the guilt and the shame and all these other parts which make me, I will be more resistant and resilient when I have to deal with the difficult, difficult times ahead, particularly I think for younger generations, we have a lot of existential crisis to kind of think of and that's heavy things. And so by embracing my eco-anxiety as, as not something that I should be pushing away, but something that I should contain inside myself and embrace of all of its complexities and hold an equilibrium of those things like a healthy biodiversity rich ecosystem i'll be more effective for climate activism i'll be more sustainable in my work like jennifer said it's a marathon and i also won't find myself paralyzed anywhere near as often if i was only ever trying to be really really positive um, and i started realizing that my eco anxiety wasn't something i should necessarily be ashamed of which is what i was at the beginning of this sort of reflection it's a sign that I care. My uh, rage that I feel is a sense of justice. It means I want to look after those who are more vulnerable than me. I want to protect them. I have a sense of duty and, and yeah, um, justice. My grief that I might be feeling is okay. It means, yes, I'm upset that things are dying and leaving and cultures and languages are also all, um, threatened, but it also makes me far more grateful for what I have still and to cherish it more. And the anxiety is my sense of urgency, it's my sense of empathy that those on the other side of the world who I may never, never meet or never know, I know that they are struggling and I want to help them, that anxiety is my empathy. And so all these parts aren't things I want to push away, it's, but stuff I want to maintain in the equilibrium just like an ecosystem would. Brambles are very important. Brambles are great for butterflies. Nettles are great for butterflies. We love butterflies. This is just me being in the UK now. <laughs> and all these little creepy crawly things are all important. They're there for a reason. They all have these interactions. And so that's how I started to become more familiar with eco anxiety and all those kind of more negative things that come up. They aren't things to be ashamed of, but to be embraced because they're what makes you you in all of your complexity. And I think we need that emotional biodiversity and complexity in order to deal with some of the difficult decisions and debates and conversation you have to have moving forward in this movement. Eloise, thank you. Thank you so much. Always so good to hear you, you know, talk about this example and this model because in a way it's, it's not just a coping mechanism, it's a fact, it's a truth, you know, it's sort of like a template for how you would run in this marathon, as we said, you know, just the same way the feminist movement found out, you know, a model to work with. This is what you're using. And I think it's really, really useful um, as an analogy to understand eco-anxiety, but also interconnectedness as it were with man and nature. And just to mention that um, while I was in the UK and I attended, you know, a physical lost species day event, there was a space at the beach where, you know, people were allowed to talk about these feelings. Oh, I miss the butterflies. These birds used to come here. They're not here anymore. You know, I miss what that impact has. You know, I, I miss the feelings I used to have then. And I thought that was really, really useful, you know, to, to be able to make space for these feelings, acknowledge them, reflect on them, and then imagine, um, imagine a future, a useful future. And um, something you said reminded me of um, a, a monk um, called Matthew Ricardo. He, he, he always talks about wise optimism. So it's in the sense that it's not, it's not a bad thing you know, to feel bad, but you can also feel joy and gratitude and grief and all of these emotions. This is, this is what makes us complex you know, and a complex ecosystem, really brilliant. I think all of our panelists have touched on really important um, bits of this conversation, interdependence, eco-emotions, and there's been so much to unpack. So so I would invite us now to just go on a five minutes comfort break, grab a coffee, something, tea, and just take a deep breath. And when we come back, there'll be lots of interactions and discussions and really looking forward to what we would take out out of this space, this really beautiful space we've made. Thank you all so much. So see you in five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I trust we have everyone back. The five minutes went by really quickly. <laughs> um, so we're going to have the, a Q&A session now. There's been comments, there are questions running through my mind, but really to have a conversation with Sarah, Beverly, Eloise, there's been so much said tonight. The presentations have been so moving and also leaving us with thoughts and reflections, which is indeed a good thing as um, we've seen tonight. So very first question to, to you, Sarah. Uh, there's been a lot of comments around the idea of kinship relationships and um, you know, your explanation of it putting yourself in relation to the climate crisis within the educational setting. So a question was asked about how can we weave connection and a sense of interdependence, perhaps to cultivate a sense of, sense of kinship with our, our own ecology? What does that look like to you? You know, someone also put in a follow-on comment, you know, to say, um, would a simpler life um, be a greater good than uh, would a simpler life mean a need to connect and need to be more relatable so what do you think about you know those conversations and it's okay to put yourself as the subject you know of your own experience thank you thank you Jennifer I love that question and I'm um, I was really stunned when I was doing my research for the book you know, the question that drove the, the, the underlying question of the book was what are the tools that this generation where my college students need to do this work for their lives? What are the emotional or existential states that we need to arrive at to be able to engage for the long term? As I started doing the research, I realized that was a misguided question, the sort of emotional states as if we could arrive to them along a journey and get somewhere and attain something. One of the things that came up in the research, though, that I was stunned by was that interconnection or a sense of collectivity or a sense of relation is actually more effective at helping people bounce back, for example, after a disaster than dollars spent on things like infrastructure. And I started to research all this work on how transformation in a collective is so much more powerful and effective than transformation that's just by yourself. And I was really raised in a very individualistic kind of American bootstrap kind of model that didn't account for that. And as a professor, I'd certainly been taught, in fact, I wasn't taught how to teach at all, but what I assumed was gonna happen in the classroom was that everybody would do the assignments I gave them. I gave them individual grades and they'd all advise individually with me. And I realized reading folks like Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire and people who do what's called liberation or, or popular education pedagogy, that in fact, as Bell Hooks puts it, the community of the, of the classroom is the lab for the world. And it allowed me to think that when students feel impatient that they're sitting in a classroom when they should be out there acting in, in, for climate, that in fact, the action of us building community and creating space as community was the outcome we needed to do. That was the most important thing that needed to happen. So I started to think critically about how are all the ways that I teach, all my policies, my syllabus, every darn thing I do, how is each one of those reinforcing individualism or per, per enabling collectivity, enabling interconnection, enabling people's ability to see themselves as as, as, as connected to each other's well-being and effective more as a group than as individuals. And so that, that's one question I started to ask and I've slowly been dismantling the own individualism in my own pedagogy and arguing to students that this is actually what the most important thing they're gonna need in life. When the pandemic hit and I had my senior capstone students, I was saying my last goodbye to them in face to face and sending them off to Zoom land, I talked to them at length about collective resilience and the mutual aid or the responsibility we have for each other, how in fact this moment of the pandemic was their capstone experience, who were they going to be, what were they going to rise to in this moment, we've been studying for four years, how important, you know, the communities that arise out of disaster, as Rebecca Solnit puts it in A Paradise Built in Hell, what is it that they were going to show, who, how are they going to test their learning now? in this moment. And 
the turn towards caregiving, responsibility to each other, the collectivity as valuable, very much in line with what Eloise was saying around ecosystems, has been a really radical pedagogy for me. And that's just one answer. I mean, I could probably talk about that ad nauseum, so I'll stop there. But um, just in terms of just the classroom, recognizing interconnection in the classroom as a lab for community building has been huge. Other people do things, and I sometimes do, to help students feel interconnected with the more than human world. Meditations on there are the air we breathe and what it's connected to, or meditations on the tree outside and what it's connected to, or what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing with a piece of paper, right? There's all kinds of ways that we can ponder and become aware of interconnection, but um, the collectivity, the sense of community in the classroom is one place that I spend a lot of time because as a professor, I was, I've totally drunk the Kool-Aid of individualism and I've had to unlearn all of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so there are two follow-up questions sort of from Joan, um, Joan Haran. Um, and I guess you've sort of touched on the, the very first one, um, thinking through how then do we expand the population of people who recognize interconnectivity, you know, without turning it, turning it into some form of, you know, spiritual ritual as it were. And I guess um, your example, what you've done in terms of putting a thinking and framing around community um, helps with that. And um, you could also um, describe what you think, can that be moved to other groups of people beyond the classroom? Is it something that can now be picked up and applied, driving that sense of community? And I know Beverly would also touch on that um, with the work she now does with, uh, with communities. And a second question, which would, would just be um, a sentence or two, um, Joanne wants to know, how does your university infrastructure in this place, the systems that you, you have to work with support or inhibits this form of pedagog pedagogy? Yeah, um, so I'll start, there's a couple questions there, I'll try to address them all. Um, I don't think you need to have a spiritual sense of interconnection or practical reverence or interbeing to, I think it's straight up science. I mean, this goes to Eloise's background, right? Um, that the reliance that we have on what happens across the globe or across time, it's temporal and spatial, right? The, the distance of climate change goes back a long, a long way in time and it goes forward a long way in time. That's the point of climate change. It's imperceptible in our temporal existence. This notion that something that's really far away from us relates to our well-being or is connected or that are, is, is down to the cellular level. And so you have people like Sandra Steingraber or other folks saying, I, I you know, give me an environmental history of your of your of your um of your you know embryonic fluid. I mean there's there's a sense of like you know, and, and Winona LaDuc talks about how you can look at breast milk and tell where someone lives and, and, and their entire environmental history. I think that um, this notion, Stacey Alema calls it um, uh, transcorporeality, right? There's this notion of our material existence relying on what has happened far away from us in time and space. And into the future, similarly, what we do now has impacts far away in time and space too. I think there's science to back that. I mean, I'm not just saying, I think there's like science backs that up. It doesn't require a spiritual, like spiritual really uh, connection to it. Um, does my university um, support or, or get in the way of this? I'd say yes and no, both and. That um, the beauty of being a college professor in the US anyway, is that I'm not inhibited by having to um, be dictated what my outcomes are for my students. I can reinvent what I want my outcomes to be because of academic freedom. It's the beauty of being a, in college instead of high school. So if all of a sudden I go from saying, my outcome is that they'll become more aware of the climate crisis and climate science and they'll get more information, the implicit understanding being that they'll do something about it. If I decided, in fact, I'm gonna make my outcomes be that they're gonna learn skills for how to do something about it for the long haul and build in a resilience, I can do that. I can ch change that. So in that sense, I have permission to do it. In another way, the institution is a neoliberal product of capitalism trying to tell students and because of student debts has, has basically shackled students to a system of having to have to, to, to pay a debt for the work that they're doing in college, which completely constrains what we can do. 
we actually have the tail wagging the dog. So for the most part, if I'm really cynical, I'd say that what we have to do is produce more capitalists to keep, keep promoting the machine that's, that's doing the damage to the environment in the first place. So there's a constant tension there with that. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Sarah. You bring so much clarity to you know, something seemingly complex. So I, I guess that's why you're an educator after all. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, so we've touched on a bit of, you know, stuff that you would want to respond to Beverly in terms of thinking and that framing around community. Um, there was a very interesting question that came up in the chat, um, wanting to know the practical early steps of your community art projects. Um, I think they're in a way low hanging, you know, feasible mm -hmm. for everyone to sort of get involved in. Who are the first people you connect to and work with to get them started up and possibly funded? And how do you and these communities make art decisions through the project? So very practical and hands-on. Thank you so much for that question as well. Thank you um, for the question too. I think it's a very important one. And it kind of um, connects with Sarah's work in the university because for many, many years, um, I was teaching art for social change and healing at the University of Washington in Tacoma, an interdisciplinary program. And part of my work there was helping students to learn how to collaborate with community. And first they had to learn how to collaborate with each other and um, facilitating that process was incredible. Um, and it really helped them in terms of their mental health um, because it was a commuter campus for non-traditional students, many first generation students. And um, so I have had decades of, um, uh, experience with facilitating collaboration. So starting it in our neighborhood was a piece of cake. Um, it was the easiest collaboration I've ever done. Um, during the pandemic, we got closer to our neighbors, which is something that, you know, I went around from door to door as soon as I knew that we had to stay home. And I brought my phone number and my email to people who I hadn't even met before, or maybe had only waved to before. And I said, we are here if you need anything. You know, if you need to brainstorm something, if you're not feeling safe, if you need to check in. So that was way back at the beginning. Um, when I was still teaching full time, I knew this was something that was essential for our neighbors and our resilience, our emotional resilience, as well as just practical. Um, eventually the neighbors who live next door said, we would love to do something with you. We have a project, um, you know, a, a corner on the, um, that's across the street from, there's a, we have tables all over Tacoma that say food is free. And that was a pandemic project of another person. So um, they said, you know, on our side of the street, we should do something. What do you want to do? And I told them about the Story Hive project I had done on Fashion Island as part of um, a permaculture design project that I had funding for uh, that was demonstrating soil remediation through plants and mushrooms. And um, they got very excited and they said, we don't know anything about permaculture design, but we like the idea of a Story Hive and so I made a poster and I stuck it on the porches of about 50 different neighbors in um, you know, this general vicinity. And uh, I called a meeting and about a little over a dozen people showed up for the first meeting. And then we began to meet every week and we brainstormed each time. I applied for, for a grant and we didn't get it. But most of what we needed was scavenged. You know, we were able to get dirt and we were able to get straw and donated plants and donated skills and donated wood from all the neighbors. So we, it, in some ways, it was better that we didn't get funding from the city. Uh, and the project is really fits in a category of disobedient art. We didn't get permission from anyone uh, except the neighbors. <laughs> And they, several people said, you know, 
this is really public land because it's on the corner where the intersection is. And we said, we don't care. And everybody loves it in the neighborhood. And um, so decisions were just made very organically. Somebody brought material, somebody else said, oh, we can use it for this and we can use it for that. And we needed to learn how to do cob because we didn't have experience making cob as a building material. So we did research online and, and just networked with people and found out who were the local experts who could give us some help. So it was a really good project, but, and I think it improved the mental health of everyone. Um, there were new neighbors who had never met anyone and had small children. And so it becomes kind of a playtime <laughs> when the kids come and get to interact when we're doing the project. So anyway, it's been, um, we hope that we can do more of them in Tacoma. Um, my goal is to see if there's a way we can improve the mental health in, in our city. So, and I want this project to be copied. So if you want to do a story hive, it's, it's all yours, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. That, that was a very brilliant um, example and very relatable. So Matt has a question, which I know you, you have a couple of answers to. He would like to hear which artists or artworks um, have most helped, you know, changed, well, I'm directing this to you, um, changed your own struggle to orientate. So I know we've spoken a, a bit mm -hmm. on that. So it'd be good to hear. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> the late Mary Beth Edelson, who was a feminist artist, was the first artist I saw who invited the audience in. She created story boxes where people could share a story about childbirth or about their mother or about their sexuality or about menstruation. And I was like, wow, this was in the seventies. You know, it was such an eye opener that you could invite the community into your project. And that really allowed me to move into that paradigm very early on. Um, when I started doing work that was vulnerable about my fears, and people would come up to me with their own stories. I was like, oh, I have to make this more explicit. I have to create a space where people can feel invited to share it with each other. And I've been doing that for decades now. It was really put down when I was in New York. I was a New York artist for many years and I was getting a lot of recognition there and, and some of the writers who would write about my work in the more prestigious places would say, you know, her work is almost great, but you know, why is she so naive and bringing the audience in? And I said, oh God, this is very clear to me that I am in the wrong place. And that this professional art world is, is messed up, you know, because the artist is supposed to be on a pedestal. Um, one other thing I should say that really gives me a lot of inspiration is speculative fiction. So I've been reading everyone from Octavia Butler to um, Ursula Le Guin for decades. And those authors gave me visions of what could be possible. Um, and I really needed it because I was in a place of despair. So yeah. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you could kindly check the Q&A, there are a couple of questions um, for you. So I'd like to wrap up with Eloise. Uh, just a very you know, quick question and your thoughts. Um, you, know, you mentioned feeling shame and guilt as part of your own experience of equal anxiety. And from where I stand in Nigeria, I don't feel guilt or shame. I feel anger, you know, and outrage at just how unfair, um, you know, the climate crisis impacts me um, in Nigeria. And how do you think knowing that, you know, knowing what I feel, what you feel, that, that comes directly to, to parents and how they're going to live and work with children. You know, and I know that's something we talked about. What would be your, would I say, reflections on thoughts on parents trying to safeguard the eco-anxiety that their children are feeling 
with all of the knowledge that Sarah has spoken about, all of these truths that they now know that climate justice is in fact a social justice issue. Very quickly, if possible. Really quickly. Um, I think so. So the research I've done in climate psychology, and again, just jumped into that after doing ecology. Um, we did a big survey on um, 10,000 children, young people asking them across the world as well. So it was an international survey asking about their thoughts and their feelings. Um, and, and these questions, this survey was based upon the uh, practice of psychotherapists and clinical psychologists, climate psychologists on their own quality and um, previous research. Um, and this relationship between young people and their parents and parents as well in the activism sphere they work with also trying to support young people. So I work with a lot of people my age or even younger um, is quite complex sometimes and and sometimes often well-meaning but misplaced where it's very so if a, a young person comes in and says I'm really upset I'm really scared I'm really worried about these things I don't know what to do I don't know what to feel it's very natural and understandable for that parent being no no it's fine don't worry it's not that bad <laughs> um you know you're being a little over emotional it's okay it's not it's not that bad and understanding that they're coming from I'm trying to make this child feel safe and secure but what we are finding is that dismissal is received as a dismissal um, before what that young person is seeing outside or reading media experiencing in their day-to-day -day life is not the same what their parent is saying that person will put what should be security and a, a trusting figure and this disconnect between what they're sort of especially if you're very is more if you're very young um, figure of what you is your sort of meter of what's going on outside and what you're seeing don't match is very discombobulating quite jarring and can increase a level of ego anxiety because you feel a bit ungrounded now you're not quite sure who to believe what to think why aren't the people who you are very connected with uh, why aren't they acting the same way I do and so we get a lot of people coming up to us with either young people or parents and how do I help my young child or person with their ego anxiety I, I, I understand I don't want to dismiss it that makes it worse it's 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 um, not allowing them to feel what they need to feel. And we often uh, very simply say that it's very important just to be like, yeah, it is scary. I, I, I'm scared yeah. too. Like, you're right to be scared. What can I do to support you? How can I, how can I help you? What would you like from me? As opposed to dismissing it necessarily, even with the best intentions. Um, and that's what we're finding with parents who are trying to support the young people coming into it is what's the most helpful thing. Sometimes they just need someone to validate them. And provide that sense of community and a space to talk about the feelings not necessarily it being rejected as something that's a bit snowflake or over emotional and i think i i had that issue a lot being such a young woman often being like if i'm getting angry or upset about something which now i feel very justified doing especially early on when i was much younger and maybe less secure and, and confident i didn't want to come across as over emotional which meant i also kept squishing down those negative feelings i didn't want to be feeling them and which now of course as i've talked about is very important to have that emotional intelligence, if anything, to deal with what is a very complex situation. Sorry, very quick answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eloise. Um, yeah, so if you also check um, the chat, um, the team has kindly reminded everyone that Caroline Hickman would be um, on ground tomorrow in a conversation, and she's really brilliant, helped both Eloise and I in navigating this experience of equal anxiety. In terms of three major takeaways from today for me, one is that denying the feelings of uh, eco anxiety and eco emotions only worsen things and it can be harmful and violent. And the more complex um, an ecosystem, which in this case is our mind, is the more stable and resilient it is. Now, finally, from me, the battle of climate adaptation will be won in our minds and art affords us a space to dig deep into these emotions or the lack of them. And it helps us to imagine our future and what we could co-create and what our role is in this really big ecosystem called Earth. And just for us to remember Remember, we are not apart from nature, we're a big part of nature. And if it impacts me from where I stand, it also impacts you. Thank you all so much for this space we created, all of the conversations. We've all done a brilliant job of weaving ecology, arts, climate education into one space. And thank you so much, Onka, for the space and for this really rich conversations. Thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks. Bye.
Okay. <laughs> I've never been so violent in my life. <laughs> it's not. You're just just ferrying them on. One at a time. <laughs> Wait, it's a good sign. It's a sign they wanted. They all wanted to oh. hang out and say something <laughs> more. It wasn't over for them. That's great. That's yeah. A sign. Yes. <laughs> oh my god that was really good thank you all so much Jennifer, yeah, you got the hardest job how is it that you got stuck with the hardest of the jobs <laughs> i know i guess it's because you know being both someone who experiences eco anxiety being an art enthusiast just wanting to know more it just helps my mind go through all of the questions and put it together and thanks maddie and Pessy for being so helpful with the copying and pasting that was really good thank you all so much so i'll just go first in terms of you know how this has been for me um, you are all such amazing panelists in terms of being able to interpret the question and, you know, what is really meant because it almost feels like we had an unsaid objective, you know, wanting to support people with, you know, what resilience means, what can you take back home, you know, what does a really strong ecosystem mean with Eloise's analogy, and I thought that was really helpful. So thank you all so much, really honored and privileged to have done this with, with you all. Thank you. Cassie, do you want to go? Oh, um, I just want, I, I thought you did a really great job of summing up, um, Jennifer, because that was really difficult. But um, talking about those three points that the three points that you made at the end. <laughs> it was lovely. And I really enjoyed hearing all the stories from the three of you. Thank you. Um, yeah. There's a lot to, um, there's a lot, there's a lot. I felt like Sarah, you were very generous in all of the kind of Sarah well all of you but Sarah and Beverly as well very generous in your references so I feel like there might be a bit of follow-up um, for participants that might be interested or attendees that might be interested but I guess we just share the link to your book <laughs> yes that would be one way of doing it <laughs> and the land it's, it's, acknowledgments yeah. sorry yeah, Sarah they were amazing yeah they were really good thank you both so much it's, that is the te tendency of, um, I mean, that's just the way I was trained as an academic that whenever you're trying to weave together all these other ideas out there, you know, you cite, you cite them, <laughs> you know, yes. it's, it's, um, it's the uh, etiquette. And so uh, we stand on shoulders. So we yeah. honor that. Yeah. It was really fun. <laughs> Beverly, what did you think? Well, Jennifer, I would have loved to have heard more about the projects that you are facilitating. Yeah, um, that was a loss for me, even though yeah. I felt you were extraordinary as moderator. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to chew on what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. In a good way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And savor it. But um, I really felt that everybody's contribution um, were beautifully interconnected um, in, in, in ways I didn't expect. Um, so that was rich for me. Um, Sarah's contribution about her students made me almost mourn the fact that I am no longer working in the classroom, but um, we're trying through our organization seeds to do a lot more um, in the community because I got really fed up with neoliberal academy. Yes, I could do whatever I wanted in the classroom, but we had one administration after another that took things away and the arts were not honored. And, you know, I had been at faculty meetings with 150 people and at times would be just trembling with rage and, and, um, almost tearing up because people, you know, administration wasn't taking the art seriously in terms of what we were able to offer students in terms of grounding in this time. Telling their stories is the most important thing and having those stories acknowledged by their peers and by respected elders, that's what university can, aside from research, and learning how to think critically, 
it's a very important thing. And when the pandemic started, I had already signed my papers for retirement. And I realized, oh my God, my students are gonna be flipping out. They, they didn't have anyone to replace me. So where were students gonna make art during the pandemic? How were they gonna be able to process stuff? And I wrote to the Seattle campus and I said, you know, this is an emergency. Can you tear up my resignation? Mm. And they said, no, it's legally binding. I said, you're crazy. There's no art teacher on our campus that's doing this work. And they said, no, nope, it's done. <laughs> and I said, well, this is really good medicine for me. It's not, uh, it's not easy to take it down, but it's another message that my work needs to be outside of the academy. Mm. And that's where it's essential right now. So anyway. I, um, I appreciate that. And I, I'm in that boat all the time and, and I agree with it completely. Um, the story is the same here. Uh, and I also want to agree, Beverly, with your point about this missing out on Jennifer part and um, <laughs> just in my own personal access to that point is that um, when I read the piece about you, Jennifer, in Yes Magazine, that one about the kind of critique of, do we need to get rid of climate anxiety? That came out a few months later than the piece I wrote on climate anxiety as a white phenomenon. And I also had just seen you in the Avaz, you know, with Eloise and Caroline Hickman and everybody else in that um, big presentation, which was, I was so, you know, I like got up, I don't even know what time, five o'clock in the morning to watch that. You know? <laughs> like, lying in my bed with my computer trying to figure it out. And just the way that you are trying to both use that concept and participate in those conversations and embolden youth activists while also maintaining a critical lens on it from your positionality is so exciting to me. And I feel like I don't have anyone to talk to about that. So <laughs> it's like, I, want, I was like, oh my God, Jennifer, she gets it. She's like one of these people out there who gets it and I'm gonna be in a room with her. So I just wanted to share with you that that's exciting to me that you are thinking about that. And, and I would love, at some point, maybe there's a future opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. And I really apologize. I guess we're really pressed for, for no, time. Tessie, is this still live on Facebook? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no one's watching. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Jennifer. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> I was like, ooh. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we it's still a safe space.